Today we're gonna work on this Clark GCX 30 forklift. There's something wrong with the mast. It will not go up beyond the first stage. The gland seal on this tilt cylinder is blown. The brake system needs a complete overhaul. The charge light here on this little indicator stays on all the time. The body of the forklift kind of leans a little bit this way. So in this bag, there are two new timing belts. That's not good. The inside bearing on this wheel is bad. All of the rear wheel bearings are bad. It works. We got brakes. Hi, pup. All right, guys, welcome back to what's gonna be part two of the repairs on this Clark GCX 30 forklift. I just wanted to take a minute real quick to answer a couple of questions from the first video. So several people asked me why I packed the rear axle bearings with grease, but did not pack the front axle bearings with grease. And it's actually a good question. I didn't even think about explaining that while I was doing it. So I know a lot of times when I work on this stuff, I kind of just zip through it and I don't explain how the, the thing works. And I forget that, you know, a certain percentage of the audience has maybe never seen the inside of a floating axle before. So let me explain how it works. This is a cutaway drawing from the service manual. So here's our, our hubs. And this is the differential portion right here, the, the axle portion of the transaxle. So you see the inner and outer roller bearings right there. And this is actually the dipstick right here that checks the fluid level in the transaxle. So the reason we don't need to pack these bearings with grease is because they're oil bath bearings. There's an oil that fills this whole entire transaxle and the oil travels down the axle tubes and it actually fills this hub section right here and these bearings right here run constantly in oil. That's why when we popped this axle out the end of the hub that oil was running down into the drain pan because th there's oil there all the time. So anyway, I hope that helps. It's, it's not a dumb question. I just forgot to explain it. Another question I got was about these brake hoses that I installed. So people were questioning how I could get away with using you know, hose clamps and brass barb fittings. These are not on the pressure side of the brake system. All these hoses do is allow brake fluid from this remote mounted brake reservoir to gravity feed down to the brake master cylinders which are mounted up here underneath of the steering column. So the pressure side of the brake system, you know, from the master cylinder to the wheel cylinders is all done with steel hard lines. There are no, you know, basically brake hoses like, you know, what you would see between the frame rail and the caliper on the front of a, of a car, front axle of a car. It's all done with hard lines on this, on this forklift. These hoses, they have no pressure. Okay, so first things first, I did find a set of forks for it. These are actually the ones off of the Big Ugly Forklift project that I had. They're class three forks, 48 inches long. They're way overkill for this forklift, but it's nice having that extra length. So the problem I'm dealing with today is that the second stage of the mast does not work. So basically the forks will go up until they basically hit the top of the mast here and then it just stops, it won't go any higher. And the way this works is kind of cool. So the mast actually has three cylinders. So there's a big one in the middle and then there's two kind of long skinny ones on the outside. And the big one in the middle is called your free lift cylinder. So that's gonna lift the forks without lifting the mast. And then when it gets to the top of its travel, the two long skinny forks are going to take over and that's going to raise the second stage of the mast and give you another, I don't know, six feet or something of, of height, a couple meters of height. So this is not a hydraulic issue because the cylinders are actually plumbed together. So the way this works, the oil comes in here. There's a kind of a valve here, which I believe is a, a blowout valve so that if you lose a hose or whatever, the thing doesn't just come crashing down into a distribution block. And then these two hoses, that one and that one, go to the bottom of these long skinny cylinders. And then up at the top here, the two cylinders are connected together with another hose. And then there's a hard line that runs all the way down the mast. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it. 
but it runs right down there into the bottom of the free lift cylinder. So I guess it's just self-proportioning and the, the free lift cylinder must have a larger diameter than these two skinny cylinders. So the oil takes the path of least resistance and it raises the, the free lift cylinder to the maximum travel and then the pressure gets high enough to make the two skinny cylinders want to come up and raise the rest of the mast. Now by the way, if you're in the market for a forklift, and if you don't have one you should be because they are super, super handy, free lift is a very important feature. So free lift means the amount that the forks can lift before the mast starts to telescope out. And a lot of manufacturers don't specify in the spec sheet what the free lift is, but that's something that you need to consider because if you have a low door or something, you know, it doesn't take very much height of the forks before the mast gets way too tall to go through the door. And actually at my old shop in the industrial complex, they had a Toyota forklift. I don't know what model it was. It was a nice machine, but it did not have any free lift at all. So what would happen with that Toyota is guys would go pick up a pallet and then they'd raise the forks up about, you know, about waist high or whatever, you know, for whatever reason. And they'd be tooling along and they wouldn't notice that the second stage of the mast had also telescoped out, you know, about half that distance. So let's say a foot and a half or something. And they'd come screaming through a garage door opening and maybe somebody forgot to open the garage door all the way and bam, you take out the bottom section of the garage door. So if you go back in my archives, there's a, a tour of my old shop building. And if you notice, looking at the garage doors on the long line of those buildings, you'll see that a lot of them have the first section of the garage door totally messed up. And that's because of that Toyota forklift. It's a garage door killer. So I set up this pancake jack so I could try to move one section of the mast inside the other section. And you can see it, it does nothing. The, the whole machine will lift off the ground before this section will move inside of the other section of the mast. And I found the problem, let me show you. Okay, so where we're gonna be looking is right here between the two sections of the mast and there's a roller. Uh, it's attached to, I believe it's attached to this section of the mast and it rides inside this channel. Okay, does everybody see that right there? That kind of round shape in there? It's a nut, I think, like a regular hex nut and it fell down on top of that bottom roller and it's actually wedged between the roller and the the channel frame of the mast. So I've got to try to get that out of there some way. And I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Okay, I spread the mast sections a little bit with a couple of wedges and then I reached in here at this flexible magnet. There it is. That's the nut right there. So I don't know if it'll come out of there or not. Okay, maybe I can just kind of leave it there. I don't know if it's a nut or some kind of a spacer, whatever it is. So now we can run it up to full height and maybe we can pull it out that way. <laughs> well, that was a problem, but that was not the problem. The problem was rust. So my good friend here, Mr. BFH, also known as the bead breaker, gave her a couple of good whacks right there where that roller is on the bottom and it popped loose. So that was a problem. It, the machine was settled so far down in the ground, it must have gotten really rusty inside there. So, so I hosed them both down with some PB Blaster. Let's uh, fire it up and see if it works now. Okay, that works. So that's the full height of the forks there. It's really not that high. Maybe 10 feet, something like that. So what, three meters? So it's only a two-stage mast. And I've got a feeling I'm gonna miss my old forklift because it had a three-stage mast. It would lift to like 14 feet. So what, what's that, almost five meters? Yeah, okay, cool. Well, I think in the spirit of us not having taken enough things apart, we should go after these mounting bolts right here. That seems to hold the green chassis of the machine to the black frame for the engine, transaxle, mast, 
you know, the hole works. So it seems like there's four big bolts on either side that kind of marry the two together. I don't think you're going to be able to see it because I can barely see it. I'm telling you what, I don't know how people get by with just a GoPro. This is awful. I can't see a dang thing. Okay, maybe you can see it right there at the tip of my finger. One of those bolts is actually loose. It's completely loose. So I think that might be the source of our problem. My theory is we just loosen them all up and let the whole machine kind of settle down and see if it straightens itself out. Okay, I loosened all the bolts on the left side of the machine and put a jack underneath that side of the mast. And I think we've made a pretty big improvement. So if you sight along the bottom beam of that mast against the canopy, it's pretty close. And then if you sight along the top of the carriage to the fenders, it's, it's off a little bit still, but it's much closer than it was. So I think we'll just button that back up and, and move on to something else. Okay, I wanna check out the alternator real quick. This is the wiring diagram that comes in the manual that I bought. And here's our alternator right here. Pretty standard Delco 10SI, you know, straight out of the GM parts book. And here's our charge indicator, uh, you know, multifunction light right here. So pretty standard setup. Looks like the charge indicating light gets a ground through the voltage regulator. And then once the regulator basically turns on, it takes away the ground and your charge indicating light should go out. So what we need to do is just make sure that we're getting what we need to get right here at the regulator. Uh, we know it's got a ground because the light's coming on. So we need to make sure it's not just being, you know, grounded through somewhere else on the harness. So we can just unplug this from the alternator and make sure that the charge light goes out. If it does and we're not getting any, in, any output from the alternator, then we're going to have to just go ahead and replace this alternator. They're super cheap. These Delco 10 SIs were literally used in everything. Okay, under the hood. I went ahead and bought a brand new battery when I first got the machine back to the shop. So this is the correct frame size to fit in this little battery tray. These things are fantastically expensive. I think that's a $125 battery and it's only, you know, 500 cold cranking amps. So anyway, there's the alternator right there buried underneath of the coolant overflow bottle. Uh, like I said, standard Delco 10 SI alternator. And here's our main charge wire right here under this boot, which is probably going to tear. And then this little connector down here is our two, two connections for the voltage regulator. And you see there's a bunch of, uh, you probably can't see because it's a stupid GoPro, but there's a bunch of crud built up in the heat sink here on this regulator. So that may be part of our problem. Anyway, probably just needs an alternator, but let's, let's fire it up. Okay, that's weird. The light did not come on. And now it's not on at all. Well, that's weird. So the alternator definitely is not charging, but that charge indicator light never came on. So normally that's a circuit problem. So I guess we better figure out what's going on. I'm pretty sure they all share the same power. Let's check the schematic, but I'm pretty sure all the dummy lights here share the same power. So it's getting power. It's just not getting the ground. Okay. I don't know what's going on here. Well, that's not very good. It's almost like it sat outside for 17 years. Let's hook up a jumper wire. So which one's which here? So ignition on, we should have power on both of those. That one's good. And that one's good. Let me get a test light so we don't blow something up here. Okay. So we got power there on the big dog about the little dog yeah okay so you, you can't see it on camera it's a super super dim but the light when I touch this wire the light on the 
the dummy light comes on on the dash. So, yeah, we're not getting the ground through our alternator. So, what can we do about that? Okay, I'm going to attempt to energize the voltage regulator using my test light. Let's see what happens here. Well, it comes on, but it does not go out. Okay, I'm calling it, needs an alternator. Okay, there it is. It's got a tag on it here. Looks like it's been rebuilt once before. So we'll see if we can get one that's a little bit less crusty. So I guess the next thing to do is go after the timing belt. And honestly, I'm tempted to let it ride because as far as I can tell, these are non-interference engines. But I mean, it's just been sitting for so long that I don't want to have problems with it and anything rubber that sits for a long time typically has problems so the biggest obstacle to this job is this crazy cooling system so it has this water pump mounted up here on this bracket with a fan to cool the radiator but what's crazy is that I don't know if you can see it see this little disc right here that's another water pump so it's got its own water pump built onto the front of the engine but because they wanted this fan drive or whatever up here at the top they just added a second water pump and I'm assuming it probably has a larger capacity too so uh, anyway looks like there's a block drain right here behind the dipstick so I'll see if I can get the coolant out of it and we'll see how big of a job it's going to be to wrestle that that water pump off and then we probably yeah, I think we're going to have to take that accessory drive pulley off the crankshaft. That should be the major obstacles. So, yeah. Let's see what happens here. Okay, that opens it up quite a bit. So, radiator looks a little rough. Transmission cooler pretty well plugged up so we'll clean both of those while we're in here it's just hilarious how they use this engine though I mean this is this is straight out of a front-wheel drive car it's a Mitsubishi 4G 64 engine and this bracket right here is where you would have your upper engine mount if you were in a front-wheel drive car and then like I said this right here is the, the regular stock water pump that's not used in this application it would have been driven I guess off of that belt so they just bolted an accessory belt way outside of that to drive the stuff they wanted to drive and built this bracket that went from the side of the head to that engine mount bracket to hold the water pump and shoved it in a forklift and forgot about it so kind of crazy anyway we got to get this plastic cover off here next and then figure out what's going on down here on the crankshaft area and we should be able to see the timing belt I don't think this is a press fit. But I could be wrong.
just a little rusty. Well, there she is. Doesn't look too awful bad. I'd say it may have been changed once before. Uh, it's pretty loose. So we'll reset the tension. Pretty easy to do. And then the big thing is you can see where it's it just sat for a long time and the belt kind of has a memory. And as you bar it over it it has some kind of spots where the belt doesn't lay doesn't lay flat. So I think it's a good idea to change it. Like I said, two belts. The small one down there runs the balance shaft, and then the big one runs the cam, and that gear down at the bottom is the oil pump. So I barred it over until the timing marks lined up. So there's one on the cam here. Corresponds to this little nub on the inside of the timing cover. The oil pump has a timing mark, the crankshaft has a timing mark, and the balance shaft has a timing mark. So we'll hang a couple new belts and be done with this. Well, I hit a bit of a snag. So this is the tensioner for the main timing belt. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, this is the tensioner for the balance shaft. It's got this little eccentric cam on the inside of it. Uh, this bearing is no good. I tried popping the seals out, cleaning it up and putting a little bit of grease in there, but there's still, there's definitely a spot where I can feel it catching. So I don't feel, feel right putting it back in. We need a new one. Well, since we have to wait for parts, I guess we might as well go ahead and take these cylinders apart. Not hard to see that this one's bad since the gland seal is hanging out, flapping in the breeze. I really don't like doing hydraulic cylinders. Oh, that wasn't too bad. Do, 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 do. That's not the right size, fella. Jeez, don't you know you're 13 16 when you see it? So I thought there was a chance we might be able to repack this cylinder in place without dismounting it because it makes such a freaking mess. But it doesn't appear that we're going to get that lucky, so we might as well just get it over with and pull it out of there. Drip pan in place. Yeah, I just do not like packing cylinders. There's no, there's no clean way to do it. Period. Well, we haven't gotten the torch out yet on this project. I guess we were due. Okay, let me catch you up. The torch came out. It did not help. The big hammers came out. That didn't really help. What I finally ended up doing is put the floor jack underneath and I spaced up from the floor jack to the bottom of the pin with some steel blocks and then lifted up one side of the machine and then whacked the top of the cylinder down and that pin finally popped up. So it moved a good half inch. I think we've got it on the run now. Thought she was going to beat me there for a minute. Well I thought when I looked at this from the top that I could just unscrew this gland but on closer inspection it would appear that this is the style that has the little well, I'm sure there's a special name for it
So on this style of cylinder, there's like a steel band in here and it winds up like a clock spring around the gland and you have to unwind it. There we go. Isn't that fun? Okay, now should be able to knock that thing out of there. There we go. So there's the gland and the piston. Well, whoever designed this cylinder must have gone to the Ford Engineering School. 21 millimeter on the bolt, 24 millimeter on the nut. 21 millimeter. Stupid. Okay, let's make this a little bit easier. Here's your problem, lady. She done blowed out. So, I don't know. Probably got rusted to the shaft. And then when I tried to extend the cylinder, it just tore the seal out. So, anyway. I'll peel all this crap out of here, clean them up, and we'll put it back together. It must have been this seal that was actually bad in the gland, because this is the pressure seal. This top one that looked like it was blown out, that's really just a wiper, so. Or it's a backup, I don't know. I'm not an expert about cylinders. I kind of muscle my way through it. I don't like doing it, but whatever. So they make all kinds of fancy tools for collapsing these seals down so you can easily install them. I don't have them, so I just do it the hard way. Oh, I should have bought the fancy tool. There we go. Can't really hurt the seals, I mean, they're so tough. That'll work. Anyway, you guys aren't watching this video for a, a how-to on fixing cylinders. So I just barely get by on it. Okay, stuff this thing back in here and be done with it. You can't have too much lube. It'd probably be a smart idea to wait until this piston seal relaxes a little bit. It's still kind of stretched out from installing it, but I think it'll go. Nope, it won't go at all. Okay. We'll have to wait. All right, guys, I got the cylinder put back together. It was like 10 o'clock at night last night when I was working on this, so I didn't feel like messing around with the camera. I just slammed it back together. Just wanted to test it with some air real quick. Sounds good. Okay, no leaks, let's throw it back in there. Hope that's the last time I have to go to the dealership for parts. I got us two new timing belt tensioners. 
I decided just to go ahead and replace both of them. I can't see this, but I bet the camera can. So there's the timing mark on the crankshaft lined up. And if we pan up, there is the timing mark on the balance shaft. And it's lined up. And we're supposed to have six millimeters deflection in the belt. That's about a quarter inch. Looks pretty good. I got it a little bit on the tight side maybe, but that's how I like it. So we'll slam the other one in. Now the other timing belt is a little more complicated. So over here, on what would be the left side of the engine or the right side of the machine down yonder right there behind the starter is a plug looks like this and you take that plug out so we're supposed to insert something in here the book suggests a screwdriver so I'm using a drill bit I'll stick it in the hole here and it's supposed to go in at least 60 millimeters and in this case, I cannot get it in, you know, even up to the flutes. So that means that the oil pump gear, which is over here, needs to be turned 360 degrees. So I guess the way this must be set up, there's a balance shaft on either side of the block. One drives off of that secondary timing belt, and the other one drives off of the oil pump. So I rotated the oil pump one full revolution, and now the drill bit goes basically all the way in. So we know we're timed right on the oil pump. Okay. Primary timing belt installed. So here's our timing mark for the cam. And the crank. And I don't know if you'll be able to see the oil pan or not. Yep, there it is. So that looks pretty good. New tensioner installed. And the spring is kind of a pain to get on there, but otherwise, Pretty simple job. So I'll bar the engine over a couple times, make sure we don't have any interference, and recheck the belt tension, and we'll go ahead and button this back up. Not a bad job, really. What were you saying? How dare you store a battery on the cold, hard cement ground? It's probably totally dead, isn't it? It's been sitting on the ground for like five days. I know. Guess we got it right. No charge light. Well, this is the air filter housing. And I guess this latch must have originally come up here yeah, latched on the sheet metal right there. But the end of it's broken off, so I dug around in my stash and I found this. I think there's a chance I can make that work. Yeah, something like that.
That'll work. It's a forklift air filter. I mean, I think it'll be just fine. Okay. Well, before we can install the air box, we better go ahead and fix this temporary dodgy wiring job that we did on the ignition module wire here from the coil to the ignition module. You know, it was only temporary unless it worked, and it did work. So in the original video where we got this machine kind of running, a lot of people speculated that maybe these wires were purposely cut in order to prevent the machine from being stolen or, I don't know, as part of the decommissioning process whenever they were sold off by the original owner. So that seems unlikely to me because it's so hard to access these wires you have to basically take the air box out to even get to them you can kind of see this distributor from the top but if you don't know exactly what you're looking for you would never know you know what these wires even do so I don't know they were obviously you know chopped right in two I just I don't have an explanation for why There we go. It's like it never happened. This is the filter for the hydraulic oil. So there's no drain port on the hydraulic tank. And there's two ways you can get the fluid out. You can actually use the, the hydraulic pump on the machine to pump the oil out of the tank. There's a service port over here on the side of the valve block. But I don't have the right fittings to hook up to that, plus it seems kind of sketchy. The other option is just to pump it out. So that's what I'm doing. See how dark it is. Almost looks like engine oil. Well, the, the service interval on the hydraulic oil is ridiculous. It's like 2,000 hours or every one calendar year. And I wonder how many people actually follow that. I doubt this forklift's gonna get 50 hours of use a year from me. Well, there were a few guys in the last video who did not approve of my cross your fingers Isaac Newton method of holding the battery in. So I guess we need a proper hold down. Now originally it would have had some kind of a bracket that went in these two holes along the side of the battery and then bolted into this one 
hole back here and the battery would have had some tabs on the side. But the battery I have doesn't have those. I'm not sure if I have the wrong frame size or what's going on. It's just a different manufacturer or what. Anyway, what I did is I bought some of these battery hold down J bolts and I found a little piece of aluminum here, drilled a hole in it and I cut a chain link in half and welded it to the bottom of the battery box. So let me get that thrown in there real quick. I'll show you how it works. Boom. Billet battery hold down. Huh? Huh? Oh, there's the engine oil. Looks pretty good to me, all things considered. Sitting in there for 17 years. I bet it was just changed before they parked it. So I bought new spark plugs for it. it takes kind of an unusual plug because it's propane. I bought some new NGKs, but I mean those look like brand new. Yeah, they've even got the anti-seize on them still. Yeah, I'm putting them back in. Oh, what a mess. I was wondering about these guys with their like fancy painted shop floors. I'm guessing they don't work on old forklifts. Well, can you tell that I worked on a forklift here? Well, you knock 17 years of moss and dust and decaying leaves off the top of this forklift and really looks pretty good. I mean, for a forklift. 
looks pretty good. So I turned the steam on after I turned the camera off and kind of hosed down the transmission and engine. Got all the oil that we spilled, you know, kind of blown off of there. So yeah, looks okay. Still some, some moss and mildew on this instrument panel. I'll have to clean that up a little bit. And I don't know if I can get a new piece of glass for that one or we'll just live with it. Now these side panels need some body work. You can see somebody's already gone at this one with a hammer trying to straighten it out, but everything's kind of tweaked a little bit. They must have crashed it into something. And then this is the latch over here and it's it's bent and sprung out of position, so I'll see if I can straighten that out. Okay, liberal application of the BFH and we're looking pretty good. Got the hinges kind of straightened out. Still got a little bit of a something funky going on here. Not too worried about it. Got the latch straightened out. I got to do a little tweaking on the other one, but yeah, shouldn't be a big deal. Nice thing about a forklift, you got a built-in anvil. Huh? Huh? Yeah, buddy. Fixed. Well, what project would be complete without a broken off bolt? And I actually managed to keep it down to one, and that's it right there on the floor pan. So let's see if we can get that thing out. Well, I think installing those floor pans is the last step. Now they were originally installed with these, I don't know what you call them, speed nuts or whatever, panel nuts, something like that. Anyway, I've destroyed all of them except for this one, getting the floor pans off. So, McMaster car to the rescue. I bought all new ones. So, I think this one goes like this. Also got all new flange bolts. Which are not long enough. Well, let's try these. That's more like it.
Okay, put that little cover back on. Protects the wiring, I guess. Using the proper black zip ties. I always get a bunch of comments when I use the white zip ties. Bro, they're not UV rated. All right guys, I think we're gonna stop there. I've got something like five hours of footage on fixing this forklift already. And I think I'm gonna stop and compile that into a video or two videos. And in the next installment, we're going to install these diaphragms in the vaporizer and the carburetor. I need to educate myself a little bit on how that works. I have never done the job before. I don't think it's gonna to be too bad, but I don't wanna bumble my way through it on the camera. I need to do a little bit of research and sort of come up with a game plan. So thank you guys for watching, and in the next video, we're gonna finish this project up.